Welcome to Riverside Bible Church, Wednesday night Bible study. Glad that you are tuning in from wherever you might be across the country as we continue our study on 1 Peter. We're still on 1 Peter chapter 1, this is week number 4, and uh, we might get through the 21st verse today, but uh, that's okay. There's a lot uh, to be said in here and a lot of different things going on that we want to look at, and we, there's no need to rush. We're, we're not in that big a hurry. So each Wednesday night, we just take as much as, as uh, the Lord allows us. And uh, so we've been talking about some incentives that Peter is giving his readers, incentives for encouragement. And boy, the, it, you know, when you think about uh, their day versus our day, really the days are no different. People needed encouraging then, just like people need encouraging today. Uh, people need to be challenged then, just like people need to be challenged today. And he's encouraging them to maintain a different lifestyle uh, as we walk a holy life in a polluted world. We'll hold up just a second. Hey, good evening. We're just getting started, so you're good. First Peter chapter 1. Encouraging them to maintain a different lifestyle while they walk a holy walk in a polluted world. So that's what he was dealing with in his day, well over 2,000 years ago. Guess what we're dealing with in our world today? The exact same thing. We need encouragement and we need to be reminded that we are to walk separate from this world and we're to walk holy in a polluted world. Now, that's not easy to do sometimes. That's hard to do sometimes. But he's been giving us some things to show us. So he's, he's going to give five incentives for keeping this encouragement. And we covered the first two last week, the grace of God and the holiness of God. And tonight we'll pick up the third one in verse 16, and it is the word of God. As it is written, be ye holy for I am holy. As it is, where was it written for Peter? First Peter was not written when Peter was at this point. When he says it is written, what, what was written for Peter? Where did he get this, it is written, be ye holy for I am holy? Where did he get that? In the Old Testament, by nowhere? Well, Leviticus, you're pretty close. Uh, Leviticus chapter 11, verse 45 says, For I am the Lord your God, that bringeth you up out of the land of Egypt. Boy, how many times did God have to remind them that he brought them up out of the land of Egypt? To be your God. And you shall therefore be holy, for I am holy. And so Peter had the Old Testament scriptures. A lot of the New Testament scriptures were being written, or some of them were written, but they weren't all, it wasn't in a book like this to be passed around. They were in scrolls that were passed from church to church to church, and different ones would read those. Uh, these were letters. These were letters written to a certain group of people. You remember in verse 1, these were written to the strangers scattered throughout Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia. And so this is, his, this is his audience that he's talking to in this first Peter. And so these letters were passed around. But he said, it is written. It is written. Now listen, when something, it is, when we see it is written in the scriptures, it is a statement that carries with it great authority for the believer, for you and me. When we can say, we believe because it is written. We live this way because it is written. We stand on that authority because 2 Timothy 3.16, that should be easy for you to remember. We remember John 3.16. Well, 2 Timothy 3.16 says, for all Scripture is given by inspiration of God. And that word inspiration means God breathed. So all the scriptures that you and I have in our hands tonight were breathed by God on holy men to pen the holy scriptures. So when we say it is written, we are standing on a great authority of the word of God. And just because somebody else says, I don't believe it, doesn't make it any less true. Because they can say whatever they want. 
God is truth, and everyone, let everyone else be a liar. And so that, that's the way it is. So just because somebody says, oh, I don't believe that, well, it doesn't matter what you believe. It matters what the Bible says. And, and I just happen to believe it. So the Word is our weapon that we fight with. Now we find that in the armor of God, the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. It's our only offensive weapon. Everything else in the armor is defensive. The shield of faith, the breastplate of righteousness, our loins guard about with truth, all these things, the helmet of all these things are for protection on defense. But there is one offensive weapon. It is the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. But it is not only a weapon for us to fight with, but it is also a light to us in a dark world. In this world in which we live, if we want to see something to encourage us, something to lift us, something to lighten our way, we find it in the Word of God. It says in Psalm 119, 105, Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. So the Word of God is not just a weapon, but it is a guide. It's a guide to us in a dark world. It is also food that strengthens us. When Jesus come out of the wilderness in Matthew chapter 4, and he had been in the wilderness for how long? 40 days. And he had nothing to eat, and he came out, he was hungry. And the devil came up to him and said, if you're really the Son of God, then command these stones to be made into bread. And he said, anybody remember what the first words out of his mouth was? Well, it wasn't the first words. <laughs> it is written, thou shalt not live by bread alone, but by what? Every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. So, oh yeah, I could change this stone into bread and I could eat it. I am hungry. But that's physical. That's, that's, that's of my flesh. I've got strength that you don't know about. It's a strength that comes from God's word. Do you remember when he met the woman of Samaria in John chapter 4? And he met her at the well, Jacob's well, and he told her who he was and all about herself, and she ran back to town and brought out the town to Jesus, and many of them got saved. Well, remember, his, where, where did he send his disciples off to that day? Into town to do what, Dad? Get some, get some food, all right? So they were hungry. He said, go on into town, get some food, because he knew he needed to meet this Samaritan woman, and he wanted a little one-on-one -on -one action, right? So, when they come back and they said, here's the food, he said, I've got meat that you know not of. And what did they say? They, they were clueless. They were like, who, who, brought him, who brought him some food out here while we were off buying food? Who? He said, don't say there's four months and then comes harvest. Lift up your eyes and look on the fields. They're white all ready to harvest. And when they looked up, they seen these town people coming out to Jesus uh, that this Samaritan woman was bringing. So it is a food that strengthens us. You cannot survive without food. Physically or spiritually. You can't, you can't survive on what you get from Sunday to Wednesday to Sunday. If, if that's all you're eating, you're going to eventually dehydrate spiritually. Right? You're going to be malnutrition spiritually. And when you get dehydrated and malnutrition, what happens? You can die. You hallucinate. You, you get deceived. Right? And when I hallucinate, am I not deceiving myself? I'm looking at something that's not there. That's what I allow myself to do when I do not feed on the Word of God. I have to eat this bread daily. Give us this day our daily bread. Do you think he meant just our physical food? I don't think so. I think he meant spiritually. I got to eat spiritually. That's why I say bring your spiritual knife and fork and spoon when you come to church so you can feed yourself. Larry?
Yeah. Yeah. Well, thanks for, sh thanks for sharing that. Right? Read through the Bible for a whole year, spent a whole year every day, read four chapters a day, and at the end of the year, you read the Old Testament once and the New Testament twice, and when you got through, somehow something said, i just take a month off. It wasn't quite a month, but it, it was enough. That I was like, oh, man. But it was enough to realize that you were hungry. Yes. I, I got hungry when I wasn't in the Word. Oh, Yeah. Oh, well, thanks for sharing that, Larry. But that, listen, folks, that's exactly the way it is. We, well, no, but let me tell you something. If we all confessed it tonight, we'd find ourselves in similar yeah. positions. We miss a day, we miss a week, we miss two weeks, we miss, you know, we didn't get in the Word like we should, but we find ourselves doing the same thing, and that is being hungry. If you didn't eat today, would you be hungry? If you didn't eat today or tomorrow, the next day? When, when, when would it kick in that you had to have something, right? So when does it kick in in your life that you have to have something spiritually? And so that's what it is. That's what the Word is. It's food that strengthens us. It's light that guides us. And yes, it is a weapon that we use for fighting. The Word of God has a setting apart ministry in the lives of, listen, this is who we're talking to, dedicated believers see if you just have heartedly believing you just have heartedly living for jesus and you're just partially living you're a part-time christian if there is such a thing but i think you know what i'm trying to say right if you're just stabbing at it in the dark once in a while none of this is going to none of this is is going to apply to you this is when you're talking about those who are dedicated believers those who want to do these things, the Word of God is a setting apart ministry for the lives of those that are... Now listen, what, you know, we, we say the, the Lord's Prayer is when He taught His disciples, uh, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. But that's not the Lord's Prayer. That's the Lord teaching His disciples how to pray. If you want to look at the Lord's Prayer, look at John chapter 17. That entire chapter is the Lord praying, and this is before he goes to the cross. But you can look that up and read it. But here's what 1717 says of John. Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. Now, somebody tell me again what the word sanctify means. Set apart by God, for God, all right? So that's what it is. So he says, sanctify them. Sanctify those that come after his disciples and sanctify these disciples through thy truth. Thy word is truth. Those who delight in God's word, they meditate on it and they seek to obey it will experience God's direction and God's blessings in their lives. Listen, the Bible's not going to lie, and God is not going to lie. We lie to ourselves. We say, well, wait a minute, I'm, I'm dedicated to the Lord, and I'm not getting those blessings. <laughs> All right? So let me just read you what the book of Psalm, and by the way, if you're reading through Psalm and Proverbs, You'll be reading this psalm tomorrow because tomorrow is August 1st. You'll be back in, or you may be way down in Psalms though. Psalm chapter 1, verse 1 through 3. Blessed, that word means happy, is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful, but his delight is in the law of the Lord. And in his law doth he meditate day and night. And he shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that bringeth forth his fruit in his season. His leaf also shall not wither, and whatsoever he doeth shall prosper. That's a promise of God. That, that's, that's, and, and the Lord is not going to lie about it or, or put the carrot out on the string and, chase, and let you chase it around but can't obtain it. It's, no, it's not going to happen. He wants us, those who delight in his word and meditate on it day and night. 
I don't know about you, listen, when I wake up in the middle of the night and I get up and I go to the bathroom or go get something to drink, I'm always thinking about the Lord. I, I mean, it's, it's, just, it's just that much part of my life. Uh, I don't get up thinking about the bills. They're not going to get paid, and it ain't going to worry me. It, it ain't going to help me any to worry about it, right? No, I'm just kidding. You know, I'm, I'm not, I don't get up thinking about that. I, I, I used to get up thinking about what lawns I'm going to mow. I don't even do that anymore. When I get up in the middle of the night, I'm thinking about the Lord. I'm, I'm walking to the fridge, and I'm thinking about what did Carol leave me that I can get no, I, I'm, think, I, I'm thinking about the Lord. I'm talking with the Lord. Uh, maybe somebody comes to my mind, or maybe a scripture comes to my mind. Maybe something rolls to my mind. And, and listen, we, we need to be meditating on God's Word, seeking to, and this, this, is, this is the part, is seeking to obey it. You know, it's one thing to hear it. It's a whole other thing to obey it. I can hear it, and I can listen to it, and I can think about it, but if I'm not going to take any action on it, how much good is it really going to do me? What it's going to do is bring some conviction. If I know to do good, what is it? What is it? Sin. Sin. That's right, sin. We're going to talk about that in a minute. The Word reveals to us some things. It reveals to us God's mind that we can learn from it. It reveals to us God's heart so that we can love it. It reveals to us God's will so that we can live it. This word is so, so important to us. The first step in keeping clean in a filthy world <laughs> is to ask this question. What does the Bible say? What does the Bible say about that? If you are willing to obey God, he will show us his truth. We don't study the Bible just to know the Bible. We do study it. We want to know it. But that's not why, just why we study the Bible. We study the Bible that we might get to know God better. He's revealed to us in this book. We get to understand him. We get to know him better as we get to know the scriptures better. <laughs> That's right. Hi, Rachel. That is right. That is right. All, all of our eggs are in that basket. I best know everything I can know about that basket. If all my eggs are going to be in that basket, I best know what I'm placing my life in. Whose hands? That's exactly right. And we use that word a lot around here, deception. If you don't know, if you didn't hear what uh, Linda said, if you don't know it, you will easily be deceived. Easily. All right, the next one, the next incentive that uh, Peter gives is in verse 17, and it is the judgment of God. This is a good one, but we'll spend a little time here because we need to understand this. If you call on the Father who without respect of persons judges according to every man's work past the time of your sojourning here in fear. Now, as God's children, we need to be serious about sin and about holy living. Do you think Christians today are serious enough about these two things? Do you think Christians today are serious, believers today are serious enough about sin? A believer, a believer, someone who's been saved, someone who's been saved, do you think, and listen, this may very well be why they struggle so much in their Christian walk, in their Christian life, is if they're not serious about sin and serious about holy living, 
I, I, think we, I think many Christians fail when it comes to that. They're a little more conservative, a little more flippant about it. That, oh, well, you know, oh, well, we're, hey, we're, we're, we're still human. We're still going to sin. We're still going to make mistakes. We're, and so they pass it off instead of become serious about sinning. But let me tell you this. God will not, will not compromise sin. He is merciful and he's forgiving. Thank God for that. But he is also a loving disciplinarian who cannot permit his children to enjoy sin. Why? Isn't that what Jesus went to the cross for? You think God is going to compromise that work? He is not. He is not. Judging according to every man's work. We need to understand what judgment we're talking about here. This is the judgment seat of Christ. This is not a judgment based on whether you're going to go to heaven or hell. This is the judgment that is based on your works as a child of God and the rewards that you'll receive for the things that you have done that has been done with the right motives and brought glory and honor to God. I want you to turn to two passages with me just so that you understand the judgment seat of Christ. Romans chapter 14. There's another judgment. What is it? The great white throne judgment. Now, who's going to be at that judgment? Well, that's true. But who is that judgment for? That's right. Do they have any chance of going to heaven at this point? Absolutely not. All right, in chapter 14 of the book of Romans, verse 10. But why dost thou judge thy brother, or why dost thou set at naught thy brother? For we shall all stand before what? The judgment seat of Christ. For it is written, oh, there it is, it is written, as I live, saith the Lord, every knee shall bow to me, and every tongue shall confess to God. So then every one of us shall give an account of himself to God. I don't even worry about what you do and passing judgment on you, driving you away because you don't see it like I see it. I don't need to be worried about all that. I need to be worried about me. Because when I stand before God, I will give an account of myself. He's not going to say, Hey, what do you think about uh, what do you think about Daniel? You know, lived all that time in Goshen. No, he he it's not. He's gonna he's gonna say, what about Joe Rager? And that's all that I'll be answering for. But it's gonna be at the judgment seat of Christ. Now let's go to Second Corinthians. Second Corinthians chapter five, verse nine. Wherefore we labor, that whether present or absent, we may be accepted of him, for we must all appear before what? The judgment seat of Christ, that everyone may receive the things done in his body according to that he had done, whether it be good or bad. So, at this judgment seat of Christ, there is no scale. There is no scale. There's a fire. Everything that you've done in your Christian life will be placed in the fire. What survives the other side of the fire is what you'll receive rewards on. And that's what Peter is talking about here. It's this judgment. It's the judgment of the believer's work. The work judgeth. And that word judges carries the meaning to judge in order to find something good. In order to find something good. God will search our motives why or why not we do what we 
do. Do we do things for selfish reasons? For personal gain? For pride's sake? All those things would be examined. Do we do things for the glory of God? Yes. Do we do things that he, in obedience to his word? Yes. Those would be. He'll examine your heart. His purpose is to glorify himself in your lives. It's, you're, you're, you're not there for, for the, oh, oh, look, look, at, look at all these bad things, you know. Oh, you didn't get very many rewards. No, it's to melt your work down to only present what glorifies him. It's a little different look at it, isn't it? We're going to be facing and that we're going to be looking at. God will give us many gifts and many privileges as we grow in our Christian lives. But let me make it clear and let us make no mistake about this. He will never give us the privilege to disobey and sin. Ever. He's no respecter of persons. He shows no partiality. And he accepts no bribes. He shows no favoritism. And if you don't get anything else tonight, get this. Years of obedience cannot purchase one hour of disobedience. Years of obedience cannot purchase one hour of disobedience. If we disobey, he chastens us. He spanks us. He convicts us. Why? Because what? That's right. He loves us. And when we obey, he takes note. We do. And he prepares the proper reward. When you obey him, he takes note and he prepares the proper reward for you and for me. Peter says in this same verse that we're sojourners. He's reminding these people, look, this is not your home. We're passing through. We are sojourners. I'm a stranger and a pilgrim in this world. Are we living like we're strangers and pilgrims? Are we living like we're fixtures set in stone and don't aim to leave? In fear. Not a fear of cringing like a slave coming before his master, but a loving reverence as a child to his father. Not a fear of judgment, though judgment can be passed uh, in, in a time of disobedience, but it's, a, it's disappointing him. It's the fear of disappointing God and sinning against his love. You know, we used to want our parents to be proud of us, didn't we? Did that ever stop you from doing certain things in your life that you were afraid it would embarrass your parents? Yes, I did. Even before I was a Christian, there were certain things I would not do because I knew what it would bring down on my parents. What happened to that? Now we don't care. This, law, this fear is a godly fear. It's a sober reverence for the Father. He is not the man upstairs. And as one Yankee baseball player said, he is not the Yankee in the sky. 
Do you know in the Old Testament that Jews were so feared of God that they would not even pronounce his holy name? Let us have that kind of reverence for our Father. Boy, what a difference it will make when we understand who God is. All right, verses 18 through 21, we have the fifth incentive that Peter has given, and it is the love of God. This paragraph here, this, these three verses, should be probably the highest motive for living holy and, and staying clean in a polluted world. Let's read those verses. For as much as you know that you were not redeemed with corruptible things as silver and gold from your vain conversation received by traditions from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ as of a lamb without blemish and without spot, who verily was foreordained before the foundations of the world, but was manifest in these last times for you who by him do believe in God that raised him up from the dead and gave him glory that your faith and hope might be in God. A reminder of our salvation experience. We take communion here at this church. We try and do it. We try and do it three or four times a year. Sometimes we don't get to that, but we should do it more often really. Because what does the Lord's Supper represent? All right, what does the cup and the bread represent? All right, his body and his blood. His body that was broken and his blood that was shed. Now, Jesus set this up. As often as you do it, right, you do remember me until I return, until I come. To remember that. And so the establishing of the Lord's Supper that we might regularly remember that he died for us. And so when we take communion, we pass out the bread, and, and then we, we talk about how uh, Paul was talking to the Corinthians, and he tells them that, this is my, that Jesus said on that night that this is my body which is broken for you. And then we pass out the cup, and, and, and as Jesus told his disciples, this is my blood that is shed for the remission of sins. And we are reminding ourselves that that's exactly what the Lord Jesus did for us. And we are reminding ourselves of our salvation experience. He reminded them of what they were. Slaves that needed to be set free. You know, the word redeemed is a theological term to, to us today. But it carried a special meaning in the first century Roman Empire because there was roughly 50 million slaves in the empire. 50 million. And many of these slaves became Christians. And as a slave, they could purchase their own freedom if they could collect enough money to pay. Or their master could sell them to someone who could pay the price to set them free. Redemption was a precious thing in that day. They knew exactly what that was about. We must never forget the slavery of sin. He reminded them of what Christ did. Slavery could not be purchased with money. It cannot be purchased, it was not purchased with corruptible things like silver and gold. You, you cannot purchase salvation. If you could, then Jesus died in vain. Only through his precious blood could we come out of the slavery of sin to be set free. The word redeem means to set free by paying a price. Peter was an eyewitness to the suffering of Jesus. He denied he knew him three times that one night. 
But early the next day, they took him out to crucify him. Don't think Peter was not somewhere watching what was going on on that cross. He was an eyewitness to the suffering of Christ, and he mentions his sacrificial death many times in this book of First and Second Peter. Do you think that had a special place in Peter's heart after he known that he had denied him, saw what he had done, then realized through the resurrection and forgiveness of his own sin of, of uh, denying him that he realized just how important this redemptive work of Calvary was, just how important this sacrificial lamb was. And he called him that, Christ the Lamb. Verse 19, but with the precious blood of Christ as a lamb without blemish and without spot. He reminded his readers of the Old Testament teaching, the doctrine of substitution, because they knew too well about the lamb without spot and blemish that had to be sacrificed once a year for their sins. Did it forgive their sins? What did it do? Covered them and did what? Shoved them ahead. And the next year when they came, they offered a lamb, covered their sin, shoved it ahead. Shoving it ahead to what? The cross. Thank you, Dan. An innocent victim giving his life for the guilty. That was substitution. We find it throughout the scriptures in Genesis 3, God killed animals in order to clothe Adam and Eve. It was a ram that died in Isaac's place on that mountain that day. And, of course, the Passover lamb, which was for the whole Jewish household. Everyone inside the, had the blood on the doorpost of the home. Inside that home, the death angel passed over. It was the Passover lamb. In Isaiah 53, the Messiah was presented as an innocent lamb. When Isaac and Abraham were headed up the mountain, Isaac said, Father, behold, the fire and the wood, but where's the lamb? Well, John the Baptist answered that when he looked up and said, Behold the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. And, of course, Abraham spoke prophetic that day, too. God will provide himself a lamb for the sacrifice. And that he did. Peter made it clear, and we need to make it clear, Christ's death was not an accident it was an appointment. We got that? It was no accident. The Sanhedrin, they think they manipulated all of that? They think they talked Pilate into scourging him and, and taking him to the cross? David wrote about his suffering on the cross hundreds of years before he ever went to the cross. It was no accident. It was an appointment. It was what had to be done in order for you and I to have forgiveness of our sins. Ordained by God before the foundations of the world. Isn't, I mean, that just is mind-blowing, isn't it? That before God ever spoke the world into being, he already knew Jesus would go to the cross and be the sacrificial lamb because we were going to mess it up. They already knew it. Now, that's hard for us to grasp, hard for me anyway, to get my arms around all of that. But it's the way that it is. From a human perspective, the Lord was cruelly murdered. We look at the cross, we can look at the agony of the cross, we can look at the torture of the cross, and we look at that and we say, man, he was cruelly murdered. But that's a human perspective. A divine perspective says he laid down his life for sinners. Jesus said, no man takes my life. I lay it down for my friends. No greater love is no man than to lay down his life for his friends. 
And that's what Jesus was doing on the cross. When you and I meditate on the sacrifice of Christ for us, then we should want to obey God. We should want to live holy lives. And we should want to do it for his glory. And that's what Peter's trying to get his readers to understand. Put these things in perspective as a believer. How hard is it for us to make this separating move from a world in which we live? How hard is it for you on the job? How hard is it to separate the two on the job? When you surround it by godless people, they say God, uh, godless things, they do godless things, how hard is that to find that place of, I'm not like that. I'm not part of that. I was somewhere the other day and somebody had banged their head and they come I was at a place of business, and they, and they uh, come busting in the door using God's name in vain. And the owner says, hey, stop that right now. You know, I don't listen to that. And, of course, he turned in, and he saw me. He knows that I'm, I'm not just a long guy. He knows I'm a preacher, Christian. I didn't say anything. I just got up and made my way outside. Because I definitely didn't want to hear any of that, you know. So a few minutes later, this person comes up to me and says, uh, I, I owe you an apology. And I said, uh, for what? And he's like, for using, you know, that kind of language, you know, hitting the head and blah, 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 this happened, that happened. You know, I'm like, dude, your apology needs to move upward. It's way above my pay grade. Right? Uh, it, it, it's, not, it's not about me. It's about him. And I thought, well, I, I, I went away saying, thank you, Lord, at least he recognized something he should not have been doing and had enough respect for me to come later and, and find me and apologize for, for saying that kind of language. Thank God for the owner that says, hey, 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 I ain't listening to that. Not in here. Right? But listen, when I am tuned in to Jesus and what he has done for me and the sacrifice that has been made by him, I should want to obey him. And I, and, I, and I mean more than just say it. I should strive to do it. Lord, I, I want to do this. I see this and I want to do this. So help me do this. Help, I, I don't know how to do this. Help me do this. He knows your heart. He knows those that really want to obey him. Those that really want to live these holy lives. And it just means different. I'm different. I don't, I don't want to be like this world. Now, I'm not saying that so that I can tell the world I'm better than them or I stick my nose looking down at them in some way. No, not at all. I don't want to be like that. I don't want to be godless in my thoughts and in my actions because he's done so much for me. That he did not have to, but he did. And God ordained it before he ever created it. So no. Pilate said, don't you know that I have the power to set you free or to kill you? He goes, you've got no power except it be given you from my father up above. I want to be different. 
I want to be different how I think. I want to be different how I react. I want to be different how I love. I want to be different how I care. I want to be different than this world. I want to live a godly life. I want to live a separated life. God's not forcing my arm up behind my back and beating me over the head to make me live right. I want to live right for his glory. I know when I stand at the judgment seat of Christ, there are going to be things that I did with the wrong motives and the wrong heart, and I know it. But boy, how I want that to be a minimum. A minimum. Any comments, questions on these 21 verses that we've covered so far? Or about some of these things, uh, some of these uh, uh, incentives that, that Peter has given tonight. We had three here tonight. We had the judgment of God. We had the word of God. And... The last one was, I'm sorry, the love of God. Any questions or comments on that? Any questions about the judgment seat of Christ? Any questions about redemption or about sacrifice? Any questions about sin? Understand, listen, Read Romans 6 if you're confused about sin and, and how we should live. Because Paul says, whoever you yield yourself instruments to obey, that's who you obey. But don't say, I've been saved by the grace of God and then so that I can go sin again. He says, God forbid no listen god is not going to allow that to happen in you me or anybody else do we try and bribe god (laughs) i take that as a yes do we try and bribe god about things we we say lord uh you know i just was kind of You know, I just was having a bad day and, you know, bad week and, you know, things weren't going my way. And every time I turned around, something happened. And so I I messed up. Can you just kind of overlook that? No, no, he's not. Can you ask forgiveness? Can you find forgiveness so that you can move on? Yes. Yes. <laughs> when he loved us, you know, he already knew we'd be there. He already knew all of that. And he loved us anyway. And he still permitted us to die for us. And how comforting is that? That God laid that burden on the stupid stuff like me. So, you know, he knows what I've been through and he loves me anyway. How much more should I be bothered? Yeah. Do you want God to be proud of you as his child? Do you want him to have confidence that he can trust you in an ungodly world? That he can trust you when you're alone? Or he can trust you in a crowd? Or he can trust you on vacation? (laughs) Or he can trust you no matter where you go? He can trust you as a child of God to live for him, to serve him, to honor him, to witness for him.
Anything else? We're going to stop there for tonight. And the next thing we're going to look at is verse 22 through chapter 2, verse 10. Now, I don't think we're going to get that in one night, but we'll get that in a couple weeks. But uh, verse 22 through the end of this chapter, and then chapter 2 through verse 10, that's your next reading assignment. And we're going to talk about Christian togetherness. Christian togetherness. We've been talking about over the last couple of weeks about living holy in an unholy world. And, and that's what we've been talking about, and that's what we really kind of finished up in that uh, last paragraph there uh, tonight. So any other questions or comments about anything we've covered up to this point? Are you getting something from this study in First Peter? All right, I hope so. We'll be on it for a while. It's only five uh, short chapters, but taking it like this takes us a little time. So I hope, I hope you're getting something. And, and if you have questions, write them down, bring them. We'll talk about them. Uh, we'll try and give you a chance for questions at the end as well as asking questions as we go through. And you can always stop me anywhere along the line and say, hey, I got a question about that or I got a comment about that. We welcome all of that. I hope that what we understand and what we get out of this study is a better look and a better idea and a better understanding about our Christian walk, our daily Christian walk, and what it, what it should look like, what God is looking for in us and to do in us and through us. All right, tonight I want to remember uh, uh, Jerry, uh, Carol's brother, in prayer. He's still, he's been moved out of the ICU, he's in a regular room. His next step will be back to the rehab and see how it goes. But he's still, uh, his eating is, is very limited. He just doesn't want anything. And so uh, be much in prayer that God will give him his appetite back and he can uh, make these changes that need to be made and, and that he can soon. Everything so far since surgery is looking good as far as the surgery is concerned. And uh, so that, that's a plus. And uh, so uh, just keep, uh, keep him in your prayers. Marlene has a friend, uh, I don't know her name, but I uh, wanted us to remember in prayer uh, that uh, has some physical challenges going on in her life and wanted us to remember her in prayer. And then also Brian Smith, Diane and Brian, that sit back here toward the back. Brian's got to have some surgery on his leg, uh, one leg at a time, one and then the other, but kind of like uh, Carol's brother Jerry, they're working on the blood flow in the veins uh, in his legs and they got to do some surgery to make that flow the way it should yes all right let's from yeah yeah so let's pray for a speedy recovery and quickly back on our feet and able to do those things again uh, need to remember uh, Andrew's sister, uh, she'll be having surgery soon. Do you, did she know when she's going to have surgery? She had some, something similar to what I went through with the gallbladder mess up in her stomach and all that. And they've been messing around with her for like a year and a half. And, and uh, she's, uh, but they've kind of got her on the right track now. And so just pray that, uh, she'll be able to get through this. So let's remember all of these as we pray tonight. All right, well, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we're just so thankful for the opportunity to come and be part of this group gathered here today, tonight, and each Wednesday night to gather around your word that we may learn from it. We may gleam from it, Lord, because we have a great desire to study it. We have a great desire to know it. And so that we can know more about you as well as your word and your instructions for our lives, that we may live the kind of holy lives, the kind of separated lives that you intend for us to live. Lord, let us do it because we want to obey it, we want to live it, and we want to bring glory to you. So God, would you get glory from each of our lives? I pray that you would help us in that walk. I pray for these that are sick, Lord. We have so many among us that are facing ailments. I pray for Jerry, 
continue to help him, Lord, to recover. I pray for Marlene's friend. You know, meet her needs, Lord. Let her know that you are there. Put your hand upon her life in a way that she would know that it is you that has touched her. And, Lord, I pray that you would be with Brian as he's facing uh, these surgeries, Lord, and, and these follow-ups and all of these things. And I know that's concerning to him. And I just pray that you would give him strength and courage and you would help him in this time of need that he has. Bless his family. I pray that you'd be with Linda's sister, Lord. Thank you for bringing her through this surgery. And, Lord, now it's recovery. So I pray that everything went well and we're thankful for that. And now, Lord, we ask that recovery would be quick and swift and, Lord, would be uh, complete and that she'd be back on her feet and back around helping take care of her mom and stuff. And, Lord, I just pray that you would bring that to pass. I pray for Andrew's sister, Lord, that you would help her. These needs that she has, I know too well on my own how long you can go with badness going on inside you before someone can put a finger on it. But, Lord, they seem to have found it. I pray that you continue to guide the doctor's knowledge and wisdom. And, Lord, that they can do the work that needs to be done and that you would help her in this time to rely and trust in you for all these things. Lord, I just pray that you'd be with each one of us. Lord, we may have other requests on our hearts tonight. Just pray that you would honor them and that you would bless them. And, Lord, just have your will and your way in every life. Thank you for these again that have come. Thank you for these on Facebook that are watching. I pray your blessings on each one. Give us safety if we travel home. And we'll give you the praise in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. You're dismissed. And Facebook, see you.